In this episode, Modern Languages and Linguistics professor Dr. Alain Takam discusses translating in the context of official bilingualism. Most teachers, educators, translators, and interpreters look at interference as a serious language mistake. Dr. Takam will outline how this prescriptive point of view does not seem to be tenable in a situation of social and official bilingualism. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this presentation in the framework of public professor speaker series. Uh, I am really honored to be here today for this talk, uh, translating in a context of uh, official bilingualism, what happens to the minority language. Um, I will start by giving you the gist of uh, what I'm, I will present to you t tonight, um, after the introduction, I will uh, define, I will define um, while giving the different types of uh, inter in 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 interference that we may encounter in a situation of social or official bilingualism. Then I will mention the fact that um, theorists of translation. Uh, educators, uh, the powers that be, would like in the process of translation languages to maintain their purity, especially the language into which the text or the message is translated. Um, after that, I will show that translation can be an instrument, a tool to, to polish up language policy. And then, um, because not all translators work for the, uh, for the government. We can have freelance translators, free thinking translators who might have, uh, whose translation may, may involve some uh, ideological undertone. And um, that's why I will insist on linguistic nationalism ideology in the process of translation. It is after that that I will give you a short conclusion uh, through prospects. So, um, why this topic? Why have I chosen this topic? It's interesting to know that the most striking similarity between Cameroon and Canada is undoubtedly their two official languages, English and French, but the minority position is reversed. In Cameroon, English is the minority official language as the English-speaking population is estimated at 20%. In Canada, however, French is the minority official language, as the general figures of the most recent population census show that the, um, French is the first home language for 8.2% of the overall population. That is roughly uh, a little bit over 23%. Uh, those figures are, for, I said the most recent uh, figures, but they are from the census of 2016 because we don't have the, the results of uh, the last year census. Um, so in these two countries that have institutionalized official bilingualism, governments ensure that linguistic communities are served in their, in their own language. For example, Article 2, Paragraph A of the Official Language Act stipulates that the purpose of the whole act is to ensure respect for English and French as the official languages of Canada and ensure equality of status and equal rights and privileges as, their use, as, they, as to their use in all federal institutions, in particular with respect to their use in parliamentary proceedings, in legislative and other instruments, in the administration of justice, in communicating with or providing services to the public and in carrying out the work of federal institutions. Article 1, paragraph 3 of the Cameroon's constitution also stipulates that the official languages of the Republic of Cameroon shall be English and French, both languages having the same status. The state shall guarantee the promotion of bilingualism throughout the country. Uh, translation is generally the means through which these governments guarantee the respect of, their consti uh, of uh, the constitutional rights of each linguistic community. For example, Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Official Language Act provides that 
every report, everything reported in official uh, reports or de of debates or other proceedings of parliament shall be reported in the official language, language in which it, it was said and the translation thereof into the other official language shall be included therewith. Other specific, other specific mentions of translation can be seen in Article 19, Paragraph 2 of the same Act, where the word translation is used three times. In Cameroon 2, Article 31, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution provides that laws shall be published in the official Gazette of the Republic in English and French, even though translation is not explicitly mentioned. Official translation... Official translations, therefore, are supposed to be idiomatic. An idiomatic translation is what? It is a translation that conforms to the speech habits of the native speakers of the target language. It is a translation that preserves the purity of this target language. In short, idiomatic translation is a translation that does not suffer from any interference. A non-idiomatic translation is therefore a translation that contains traces of the source language incorporated in the target language. In this presentation, I will show the different types of interference that may occur in translations and that, in spite of all possible prescriptive recommendations, interference might not even be a problem, as will be shown. Um, before talking about type of interference, I will uh, give a linguistic definition of, uh, of um, uh, interference. Uh, linguistic interference is a transfer, is the transfer of elements from one language to another. Sociolinguistics shows that interference is the product of language contact in the same linguistic ecosystem and that these languages influence each other. Since it's rare, almost impossible, to have a, um, a, 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 a situation where just one language will be used in, in, in any context, so we expect languages to influence each other around the world, in, uh, uh, especially in these officially bilingual countries. Um, Interference, therefore, occurs when a bilingual person uses a phonetic, morphological, lexical, or syntactic feature characteristic of the source language in a target language. Um, it would be interesting to distinguish between interference that occurs in the learning process of a second language or foreign language, that is, interference in a sort of interlanguage, interlanguage because the learner is still in the process of learning. We are not referring to that type of interference. We are rather referring to the interferences um, that have been so fossilized in the uh, mother tongue of any speaker that the speaker himself or herself does not know that it is still it is a, 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 an interference. For example, in Canada, appliquer pour un emploi or sauver de l'argent um, are uh, features of mainstream French. In Cameroon civil service, to treat a dossier instead of to process a file, to be titularized instead of to be given a permanent appointment, to be given per a permanent appointment, or to be detached uh, for, uh, to be, um, to be uh, seconded, or to be sent on secondment, are also features of mainstream English there. In all these cases, Translation linguists speak of language contamination, even though some speakers of French in Canada or English in Cameroon might voluntarily resort to these interferences to show their love for their language variety. Others sometimes do so out of linguistic nationalism, that is, the defense of the language, specific, uh, language specificities of one's nation. It turns out that the statistically um, and even statutorily minority languages, that is, the languages into which texts are generally translated, um, are those that are most subject to interference. Such languages are also called recipient languages. Um, 
and the source language will be called donor language. Um, so it should be specified here that the target of national education in Cameroon is standard British English, and so examples in Cameroon English will be compared to uh, uh, features in standard British English. What are the types of interference? Um, it must be recognized that some interference have already been adopted in standard language. And in this case, we no longer speak of interferences, but of linguistic borrowings. Um, French, for example, has words like kidnapper, flirter, shopping, parking, jogging, jogging, jogging yeah. And uh, those words were alone words from English, but they have... They are so common in French that a French speaker might not even know that those words are actually English words. Um, by the same token, um, uh, words like café, chauffeur, elite, champagne, bra, or the long form brasier, or even table, uh, even table, are French words um, that are incorporated in English. I don't know if uh, people might even uh, know that table is a French word that first appeared in English in the 15th century, uh, precisely in 1455 after the Norman conquest. So there's this linguistic give and take among languages that are in contact in one way or another. So we are, no, we are not talking of that type of interference. We are rather talking of interferences in the language as as, as, as they are today. Uh, that's why it's always important while analyzing uh, a language to take into account the synchronic axis of analysis, that is the analysis of the language as it is spoken here and now, as opposed to the diachronic axis of analysis, that is the analysis of a language in its evolution from the historical point of view, how languages have evolved. We are not talking about diachronic axis of analysis in this talk, but rather the synchronic aspect uh, axis of analysis, language as, um, as they are used today. Um, now I'll go back. Uh, so whatever the case, interferences can be phonetic, lexical, syntagmatic, syntactic, or image-based. Um, this taxonomy of analyzing interferences uh, is borrowed from uh, Jean-Guy Boujeke in his uh, uh, PhD dissertation uh, defended at Dalhousie University in 2007. He actually started this type of uh, analysis as interference goes. Let us start with uh, phonetic interferences. Um, phonetic interferences affect mainly oral speech. One example is the diphthongization of monophthongs, especially long vowels in tonic position. Um, a monophthong is a sequence of two vowels used in the same syllable. Normally, international French does not allow diphthongs in a syllable. But because it is a feature of English, Canadian French borrows that from English and actually mono, uh, diphthongize monophthongs. We can see that in words like, instead of saying rêve, uh, Canadian French speakers would say something close to rife. Instead of cut, they would say coat. Instead of pair, they would say pair. And then we clearly see the use of two vowels in the same syllable, which is not normally permissible in, uh, in, 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 uh, in international French. And we can expect the reverse in Cameroon English. So instead of having, if, I instead of diphthongizing monophthongs, Cameroon English with do the reverse. So where English would have, standard English would have, would use two vowels in the same syllable, uh, Cameroon English would rather prefer the use of just one vowel in a, in a, in a, in a, in a syllable. And so, um, uh, instead of saying take, 
they would say take by using just a monotone, one vowel. Instead of saying tomato, they would say tomato, tomato, in this way. Um, in addition to, uh, in addition to this um, uh, 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 monothongization of diphthongs, Cameroon English speakers, uh, in a sequence of three vowels in the same syllable, that is what is technically called a triphthong, uh, because that is permissible in English, Cameroon English speakers will divide that, that type of syllables into two syllables. Um, for example, uh, a word like player, Cameroon English speakers will pronounce a word like that as player, because this disyllabification, that is dividing a syllable into two syllables, is usually done through glide formation. A glide is also called semi-vowel, semi-consonant, which is y and w. So Cameroon English speakers will use the sound y and the sound w to divide a standard English, a standard British English uh, monophthong into two syllables. So I mentioned the example of uh, player, which is pronounced player. Another example is mare, which is pronounced mayo. Fire, fire. Power, power. And when I say power, <laughs> I, I think of uh, a famous political party in Cameroon whose slogan is uh, uh, power to the people and equal opportunity, and everyone would say, SDF, power, power, power. So that's um, how they try to divide um, uh, a, 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 a syllable into two syllables because in Cameroon English, it's almost rare to use a triphthong, uh, not even a diphthong for that matter. Uh, another thing, uh, another uh, phenomenon that occurs in Canadian French is the shortening of vowels. The shortening of vowels. And that shortening of vowels um, um, is, at, is with uh, E, the E sound, and the U sound. So in Canadian French, uh, words like vite or lune are pronounced as Vet, with a, which is short, shorter than what is obtained in French. Uh, vet or len, len. Those are short vowels that normally are not used in international French. Um, I started by saying that phonetic interference mainly affects oral speech. Uh, but there are occasions, there are some cases where... Um, uh, the, um, this, this type of interference can be in the, written, in the written language, especially in literary texts where they serve to highlight the identity of the characters, as in the translation of Shakespeare's Macbeth by Michel Garneau. There we have, uh, an, uh, 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 we have um, a sentence like, O oh, nation misérable. J'appartiens à une nation bien misérable. J'appartiens à un. Instead of une, uh, we have un, where u is shortened. How about, uh, lexical, how about lexical interferences? I would say that lexical interference normally refers to borrowing, to borrowings that, that have not yet entered into the use of the standard language. It can be a borrowing of the signifier or borrowing of the signified. In the case of borrowing of, borrowing of the signifier, a foreign form is important, is important to name an extralinguistic form that is foreign to the host language. For example, Cameroon English, uh, um, for example, Cameroon English contains many borrowings from French um, such as bon de caisse for pay voucher, chargé de mission for official representative, commissariat for police station, and, and many more, 
many more, really many more. In Canada, many borrowings from English are found in French. Examples include uh, fun, fun, peanut, cheque, and words like that. Um, so when I said uh, borrowing of the signifier, it is really taking the form in a foreign language and use it almost the same way with the same uh, spelling, almost. But we also have borrowings of the, uh, of the signified. In that case, uh, we take a form that is foreign in a target language and translate it word for word in the target language. That's why uh, this type of uh, phenomenon is, called, is also called loan translation. Um, for example, in Canada, on sauve de l'argent instead of épargne. On sauve un texte instead of sauvegarde. Or on sauve du temps instead of uh, gagne du temps. On complète un travail instead of termine or fini un travail. Uh, on charge 200 dollars, par exemple, for example, pour un travail, on charge 200 dollars instead of on exige or on fait payer 200 dollars pour un travail. In Cameroon English, too, phrases like to deposit an application induced by déposer une demande, to deposit an application uh, instead of to submit or hand in. Um, uh, the, uh, the doliences of the population. I'm not sure that the word um, uh, doliences is actually an English word, I doubt, but um, I mean, uh, English word from the perspective of standard British English. But of course, it, th such a word is used, um, it's quite commonplace in Cameroon English, where people can say the doliences of the population instead of the grievance of the population, or the incivism of the population for the lack of civic responsibility. They are used every day on the media, at times by seasoned journalists. And we know that generally, journalists can be considered as norm setters to an extent. Syntagmatic interferences. Um, syntams, a syntam is a locution or phrase, a group of fixed words which normally correspond to semantic units in standard language. Syntagmatic interferences are therefore uh, syntagmatic loan translations. That is a form, an expression taken, uh, borrowed from a, or from a foreign language and translated into uh, uh, the target language. Uh, so such uh, expressions have words of the target language, but the whole meaning of it, the whole meaning of the expression is actually foreign. Um, in Cameroon English, we have phrases such as police commissioner for police superintendent, chief of service for section head, procurer of the republic for state prosecutor, and in Canadian French, we have syntagmatic calques such as, excuse me, such as aller en grève for se mettre en grève, patate chaude for sujet brûlant, prendre le blâme for endosser or porter or assumer la responsabilité, prendre pour acquis instead of tenir pour acquis. Syntactic interferences, uh, they are construction mistakes. Um, syntactic interferences affect grammar and sentence structures. Syntactic, they, 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 are, they are numerous in Cameroon English and, ca and, 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 and Canadian French. In Cameroon, we have expressions such as, I am here since 8 o'clock, I am here since o'clock, induced by French, je suis, je suis ici depuis 8 heures, I am here since 8 o'clock, my luggages are very heavy, induced by French, mes bagages sont lourds, sont très lourds, the Ministry of the Economy, for Ministry of Economy, uh, and this very French, while waiting for your favorite response, 
I remain your humble applicant or something, where we clearly see this verbose uh, formula of, of uh, French letter writing. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the examples. And in Canada, we are used to sentences such as Ils ont marché au campus. Ils ont marché au campus. Instead of Ils sont allés au campus à pied. And I remember whenever I hear such a sentence, I always ask myself, I always ask, but, 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 but what's wrong? What have they done? What, what, what is the grievance? Why are they marching? So, well, until I uh, clearly understood that there might be quite some interferences, even at the uh, grammatical level uh, between um, the majority English, the majority language English and the minority French. So we have, uh, in the same connection, sentences like J'ai conduit au travail, instead of Je suis allé au travail en voiture. C'est la fille que je sors avec, instead of C'est la fille avec qui je sors. Uh, because normally, in French, uh, we don't isolate a preposition at the end of a clause or at the end of a sentence. But that is permissible in English. We also have the uh, interference based on images. Image-based interferences are sociocultural interference in idioms. Cameroon English has idioms uh, like to be more royalist than the king instead of to be more Catholic than the pope. And we clearly see the reverse in Canadian French where people say être plus catholique que le pape instead of être plus royaliste que le roi. Uh, we have uh, in Cameroon English expressions like to be, on the, to be in the bus, to be in the train, to be in the plane while traveling instead of to be on the bus. And if we want to look at it from the logical point of view, I would wonder, it is true that languages are not meant to be that logical, but I would wonder why people would want to be on the plane. I can imagine, uh, I don't know if I can imagine people crossing the Atlantic Ocean while being on the plane. See, on the plane, that, that, that can be perilous, uh, I, I think. So uh, 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 Cameroon English speakers, and probably speakers of other Englishes, rectify this seeming anomaly in English by actually using the preposition in, at times inside. The, the thing that that's where security is, I think. Um, and then uh, um, in, uh, the, the reverse is also true in, in Canadian French. The reverse is true. Why? Because in Canadian French, um, uh, uh, people are sur le bus, sur le train, sur l'avion. So the influence changes the direction depending on what language is the minority language in this, in this case. Um, so in addition to such, uh, to such expressions, um, in Canada we also have uh, other examples like être dans le même bateau instead of être logé à la même enseigne, manquer le bateau instead of manquer le coche, Être dans l'eau chaude instead of être dans le pétrin. Sortir le chat du sac instead of vendre la mèche. Um, être dans les souliers de quelqu'un instead of être à la place de quelqu'un, etc. So we have seen all these examples that are really commonplace in Canadian French and uh, Cameroon English. And yet, despite the existence of these interferences that regularly pepper the discourse, the translator is always reminded of the need to respect the purity and genius of the language into which a text is translated. Is that even possible? That's a question to really ask. But what is sure is that uh, the powers that be, the theorists, educators, they would always want translators and other language users to maintain the purity of languages. And uh, from the structural point of view, 
by declaring that a language is a closed system that only respects its internal structures, Ferdinand de Saussure presupposes that no language can be subjected to the structure of another language. Since the translator is supposed to put, or to put his or her bilingualism at the service of two unilingualisms, it is desirable, even normal, that each unilingual citizen receives the message in his or her own language, which is then, uh, and that language is conceived as a pure entity. For some theorists, preserving the integrity of the target language is the responsibility of the translator who will make sure that their translation reads fluently because it bears no marks of a foreign language or culture. It is up to the translator to avoid these, to avoid these uh, marks of foreign language. In this connection, Delil underscores one of the main tasks of a translator is to keep languages apart so as to avoid interferences, how subtle they may be. The translator is indeed a bilingual, but a bilingual who fiercely and systematically opposes all forms of interference. In a more vivid metaphor, Cazares, likening translation to a customs post, invites the translator to redouble his or her vigilance so as, not to, let, so as uh, not to let smuggled goods infiltrate the target language and ruin its internal economy. He writes, translation is like a customs house through which passes. If the customs officers are not alert, more smuggled goods um, than, um, uh, more smuggled goods of foreign idioms than through any linguistic frontier. In other words, a language involved in the translating operation must be able to retain its structural purity. We will now see how translation can contribute to, um, to um, language policy of a nation. In Canada and Cameroon, translation seems to have been instituted to maintain two unilingualisms. Um, to make sure each citizen is served in their own language. It is true that this is more so in Canada than it is in Cameroon. From simple observation, it can be said that the policy of official or state or institutionalized bilingualism is aimed at giving each of the two linguistic communities that make up the nation the possibility of preserving its unilingualism, the central government managing uh, and practicing bilingualism um, in institutions under its control. McKee more aptly concludes that a state is not bilingual because its citizens are, but, it's a, it's, but it is bilingual because as a state, it works with more than one language so that citizens can express themselves in one language. And the state generally does this via translation. Translators' tasks in Canada include the standardization of the French language. Let's recall that a standardized language is a language which has a single widely accepted norm which, considered, which is considered by most speakers to be the appropriate or correct norm. That is why the Translation Bureau in Canada set up in 1975 a terminology and documentation service which now employs over 100 terminologists whose role is to develop and formalize the French language in Canada through um, translation. Needless to mention that after the adoption of the Official Language Act in 1969, most translators, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, were recruited from Europe, particularly from France. The Office Québécois de la Langue Française, created in 1961, to be responsible for linguistic officialization, terminological, um, uh, terminological recommendations, and the francization of the language of work in both the public and the private sectors in Quebec, and from 1977, for ensuring that the Charte de la Langue Française be complied with in Quebec, and for monitoring the province's language situation 
is now contributing tremendously to the standardization of French terminology in Canada and even in the whole of the Francophone world. The contribution of the Office Québécois de la langue française therefore facilitates the job of the Translation Bureau. In fact, the Office Québécois de la langue française, through Le Grand Dictionnaire Terminologique du Québec, has published hundreds of lexicons, brochures, and, and prescriptive lists on the identification and translation of uh, terminology in the fields of advanced technologies, computer science, construction, food, health, and social affairs, industry, insurance, motor vehicles, office work, management, distance teaching and telework, and now um, of COVID-19 pandemic, amongst other fields. I should also mention here the Government of Canada's Terminology and Ling Linguistic Data Bank, Termium Plus, which contains millions of terms in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. All translators, at least those working for the federal government, know that interference is not acceptable. Any official translation is expected to abide by the rules put forth by the federal government through, for the case of Canada, the Translation Bureau, which, with the Office Québécois de la langue française, is the powerhouse of language policy and planning of the federal government. But of course, not all translators work for the federal government. There are translators who are free thinkers and uh, who might have their own opinion of translation, who might have uh, the ideology of constructing a different type of national language for the people. Um, translation can also be a means to convey an ideology. For example, if a translator adheres to the domestica domestication ideology, that is the ideology of a national language that markedly differs from the official norms, they will choose to incorporate in their translation some of the linguistic features that are characteristic of the local variety of language. This ideological translation is generally found in literary works and literary translations. When Michel Garneau wrote on the frontispiece of Shakespeare's Macbeth, translated into Québécois by Michel Garneau, traduit en Québécois par Michel Garneau, he wanted the reader to remember that Québécois is indeed a language, if not distinct from French, at least a language with its own specificities. More importantly, it is not common to find a translated work with the mention of the target language. When we usually see, when, what we usually see is rather the mention of the source language, translated from X language, because the target language is already visible, it's what we are reading, so we see it. Um, but in, the, in, the, in this specific case, as Brisset writes, when one feels the need to indicate that one is translating into Quebecois, it is precisely because it is not self-evident that one can translate into Quebecois. This formulation underlines the marginality of the language thus designated. The formulation translated into Quebecois participates in the ideological construction of the presumed difference between Quebecois and French. With authority, this formula signs the birth certificate of a language that translation will be responsible for revealing. Um, if, uh, if, Michel, uh, uh, if Michel Garneau thought it wise to make this clarification, it is also because he believes that so-called international French is incapable of expressing the reality of, of Quebec. The translator, driven by a linguistic nationalism ideology, therefore takes on the task of revealing this language to the world through great classics of literature, such as Macbeth. His role is therefore to legitimize Quebecois by, by de-dialectizing it, that is, by making sure that uh, Quebecois will no longer be looked at as a dialect of French, but as a language on its own. As Brisset says, this proves that Quebecois is the language of a people and that it can perform the literary function of French for that people. The roles are reversed. 
um, when we translate, we want a, a, a work that exists in a foreign language, none in the target language. But it is not the case for, for uh, 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 Quebec, uh, Quebec translators uh, with this ideology. The purpose of translation is not to introduce the other or to publicize the foreign work for them. It is rather the foreign work that has the task of revealing and guaranteeing the existence of the language of translation through, through, uh, 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 through it, of guaranteeing the existence of the Quebec people. By entrusting, for example, Shakespeare with the task of establishing the legitimacy of Quebecois as a literary language and subsequently as a national language, um, they are also entrusted with reflecting the realities of the society that speaks this language. Um, and uh, we, 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 we can imagine that translation, in this case, might be considered as uh, an act of activism and resistance against the imposed norms. Um, it may be viewed as an act of emancipation and domestication. And we can see here um, an example, uh, uh, which is an excerpt from uh, uh, Macbeth, translated by Michel Garneau. And if we pay attention to the words in bold, we will see that they all belong to the socialect of, of, of Quebec, of the Quebec people. Uh, tout, that is feminine, which is used as neutral. P, pu, avoué, uh, with the, with the monodiphthongization that I mentioned a little bit ago, etc. They are common features of French in Quebec. Most of those words are phonetisms or phonetic spellings. And there we are referring to words written the way they are pronounced in popular language. The uh, second example uh, is, is drawn from uh, the uh, translated version, version of, uh, of uh, Der Gute Mensch von Zetswan by Bertolt Brecht. Um, and we see there um, uh, uh, the, the character Wang whom is uh, considered as the very symbol of the ordinary Quebecer. He expresses himself as any Quebecer would. Je suis vendeur d'eau, je suis vendeur d'eau, instead of je suis marchand d'eau, euh, sué, for sur les, euh, dans air, for dans les airs, etc. And this other example is from... Uh, um, the, 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 client, the, the, um, um, where is that? This, this example is, uh, the, from, uh, uh, the Kleinburger Hochzeit, still by, uh, by Bertolt Brecht. Um, and in this example, we have, uh, a say, I can't imagine any uh, C in French written with a CD when the, the following uh, uh, letter is E. So it is written that way, probably to, to give the impression that is the popular language is the language of the people. Um, we have things like uh, HT, which is written exactly the way it is pronounced. Uh, sable. Sable is an interesting case because it is... Uh, uh, the interference form from the verb to send in English, which is used in Quebec or in Canada as sable, instead of uh, standard French pensé. Um, so these are some of the examples that are that are uh, that are, I could find out very quickly, and uh, um, I'm planning to develop this this work with more examples both from Canada and Cameroon in, translate, in literary translation. Um, whatever the case, um, even though the specificities of the French language spoken in, in Quebec encountered in these examples are not necessarily interferences from English, they are indeed the sociolects of the Quebec people. Translators have domesticated the French language in, the, in these works in order to reveal the Quebecois language, which in their eyes is no longer a dialect, but a language equal to the French of France, even if at times we have the impression that the translators force 
some words or expressions just to make sure that they look different from their equivalent in standard French. Hence the expression, the ideology of linguistic nationalism via translation. And so the last few words, um, as shown in this presentation, interference is not always a problem. In the context of official and, and social bilingualism, it may, not even be, it may not even be avoided. More importantly, interference could be a potential solution to translation problems where the prescribed norms may, be, may, may not be able to, 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 to convey the message to the targeted readership or audience. Let us imagine a commercial uh, inviting the Saguenay Lac Saint Jean people, or the people of Gaspésie, or Ile de la Madeleine, or the Francescois, or the Franco Albertans. So, a, a, a commercial inviting them to buy a specific type of watermelon. Let us imagine for a second that the translator wants to respect the so called international French and translate watermelon by pastèque instead of the interference form. Melon d'eau. No one will probably buy it because people may not know what pastèque is. So the social linguistic considerations should be taken into account when translating in the context of, of official or social bilingualism. A good translator should always have in mind these questions. Um, what is the text to be translated? Who are the receivers of the translated text? What are the reasons why the text is translated? Good translators make sure to attain a sufficient standard of linguistic competence, including competence in multi-dialectalism in the same language, but should also equip themselves with great communicative competence. After all, translation is primarily an act of communication. If one translates into perfect French or perfect English from the normative point of view, but fails to communicate the intended message, that means the translation, uh, the language of the translation may be perfect, but the translation itself will be imperfect. Thanks so much for your kind attention. In our next episode, mathematics and computer science professor Dr. Habiba Kadiri examines resilience in mathematics 